Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Quite up to it, so you're going to have to have this one in English. The Wesleyans have come to Lexington, walked through the airport and saw that big marquee, Welcome Wesleyans. Newspapers here in town are talking about Wesleyans are here. It's on TV. It's all over the place. The Wesleyans are here. And I imagine there are people out there on the street saying, well, good deal. Who are the Wesleyans? What does it mean to be a Wesleyan? And they're saying, well, they smile more than most people. They tip less than most people. <laughs> Hope a few of them know that we love Jesus before the week is out. I'm not so worried that there are people out there that don't know what it means to be a Wesleyan. I'm a little more worried about the people in this room who don't know what it means to be a Wesleyan. Some of you have been attending Wesleyan churches for years and you couldn't answer the question. Some of you pastors took courses a few years ago, passed them, probably with a C, and you don't know what a Wesleyan is either. So what does it mean to be a Wesleyan? Well, we know it means to be Protestant. We, we know it means that we're somehow connected to the Methodists. And uh, yes, yes, there's lots of things that we know. We know that uh, we're evangelical, and, and we know that we are so... I'm sorry, I better look at <laughs> We know some people think we're fundamentalists. Some people think we're evangelical. We're charismatic, except we have to explain that to most people. Partially charismatic. <laughs> and we're holiness people. We're holiness people. I don't have time to give a history lesson this morning. I wouldn't want to if I had the time. I just want to give you four basic principles of what it means today to be a Wesleyan. First point is Wesleyans give top priority to salvation. This is what he said. This is what John Wesley said. You have nothing to do but save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in the work. Well, you say, that's a no-brainer. Is it? Is it, people? I've been listening. I've been listening recently over the past few months and years. I don't think there's one song in 20 of the contemporary songs that we sing that uses the word saved anymore. Not many use the word sin. You talk about a lot of wonderful things, but something's happening to this word. It's fading. I don't hear as many sermons as I used to, Dr. Lyon, about the word salvation. And you say, well, the problem is we've used it so long and so badly that it, it, can we, can't we come up with something fresh to say? Isn't there another way to say it? I don't know. Somehow we have heard the joyful sound, Jesus refreshes, doesn't do it for me. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that fulfills a guy like me doesn't do it. It's about salvation, people. It's about salvation. And that brings me probably to my second point, is that the problem is not that we've used the word and it's, it's become a bad word, it's that we've misused the word. And over time, it's, it's, it's taken on images and ideas out there that we're not comfortable with. Fact of the matter is, Paul liked the word. He said, by grace, you are being saved. Jesus liked the word. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. I think God liked the word. You will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So what we've got to do is not come up with new words. We've got to make this word have some meaning. And so the way we give it meaning is to remember that Wesleyans have big picture salvation. Of all of the quotes that John Wesley has written, this is my favorite. I quote this in my life over and over again. Salvation is the entire work of God from the first dawning of conscience in the soul until it is completed, it's consummated in glory. God's been saving me, people. He started saving me when I was five or six years old when he first began speaking to me. And you know what? He's still speaking to me. And yes, there is a sense in which, you can back that up, we're not there yet. Uh, there's a sense in which we, we haven't yet achieved that wonderful salvation that he has planned for us. Salvation is more than praying a sinner's prayer. Salvation is more than a been there, done that conversion. Salva salvation is even more than saved, sanctified, and autopilot. God isn't finished with any of us yet. 
And he's got a saving work that he wants to do. I don't care where you drop entire sanctification into that picture. I know there's a lot of different opinions about where it goes. All I want to tell you is wherever you are in this room, if you're a Wesleyan, God is still asking you for more. And he's wanting to deliver you from more. Things now maybe that you're not even aware of. Last night I heard some things that I needed to be aware of. And I was glad to see Wesleyans coming forward and repenting yesterday. It keeps going, doesn't it? It keeps going. Salvation is the entire work. And it's not just us. God wants to save marriages. God wants to save families. God wants your church to get outside of its walls and start saving the neighborhood, the community, justice and mercy. It's part of the saving work. Who knows but what God has called the Wesleyan Church to save a nation. And then, yesterday morning, that vision of the fact that salvation is something that could expand around the globe, that it could become global, that we could really pray, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. That's big picture salvation. And we Wesleyans must never forget that. We must not ignore the wonderful experience of conversion and saving, but, but we've got to discover big picture salvation in what we're doing. And that means, number three, that Wesleyans are going to have to be unconventional in order to get the task done. There used to be boxes. There were boxes all over England, and every minister was supposed to stay in his box. And one of the ministers got out of his box, and he got called into headquarters. And somebody said, John Wesley, where's your box? And John Wesley says, I don't have a box. Say it with me. The world is my parish. Say it again. The world is my parish. John Wesley was willing to jump out of his box to get the job done, and we ought to be willing to do the same thing. He couldn't get ministers to get outside of their pulpits, so he had lay preachers go and stand on coal piles in order to get the word out. The coal miners, when they got saved, didn't feel clean enough to go into those nice, pretty churches. So he started little classes and meetings and societies and preaching houses so that they could hear the word of God. He was unconventional. And we need to be unconventional, too. John Wesley always respected the church. He respected authority. But he was more important and more concerned about getting the job done than he was making sure he stayed in the box. I'm not going to politic when I say this. I'm not politicking at all, but this is one of the most important days in the history of the Wesleyan Church. You know that. That's why you delegates are sitting here. Whatever way we decide today, whatever way to decide, I thank God for leadership that said, we need to stop once in a while and ask, is there a better way to do it? Is there a different way to do it? I'm glad I belong to a church that says, you can think outside the box. And as long as it's true to God's word and it's respectful authority, we're going to give you freedom. We're going to give you freedom to think outside the box. So John Wesley said, we can't get the job done with paid clergy. We can't get the job done with paid clergy. We've got to have lay people helping us. And he set up a whole system of lay ministry. We've got to watch it, Wesleyans. We're moving more and more back to hiring people to do the things that lay people ought to be doing. Sunday school teachers, working with the youth, reaching out in those compassion things, equip the laity, the people, for the work of ministry. That's unconventional, and we need to do it. We were unconventional about women in our tradition. We were so unconventional. We, we broke through the barriers. We have that wonderful history, that wonderful history that I felt so saddened about. I was one of over maybe 90 or 100 individuals yesterday who got medals pinned on us. Not one woman was in that group. A rich heritage that we like to brag about, about Seneca Falls. We dropped the ball. We're picking it up again. Let's be unconventional. Let's be a church that says we welcome and encourage the work of the women who join us in this great task that we have to do. And you're hearing it all through this conference, and you'll hear it for the next four years. You'll hear it for the next four years, whoever our leaders are in this denomination. We have got to become people of diversity. We have got to change the color of the next general conference. We must reach out around the world. We must reach to our cities. We must be unconventional. We must be unconventional in order to get the job done. And finally, 
The fourth point is Wesleyans are optimistic about the possibilities of grace. Wesleyans are optimistic about the... They called it Titanic mindset. Well, they didn't call it Titanic mindset. The Titanic hadn't gone down yet. But the guy that came up with it called it lifeboat theology. Lifeboat theology. Here's the ship. Here's the Titanic. It was one of the most beautiful things that was ever made, but it ran aground. It hit a, it hit a rough spot. And almost immediately after it hit the rough spot, everybody said, she's going down, she's going down. And so they didn't bother to try to fix the ship. All they did was pull out the lifeboats and got as many people as they could in the lifeboats and all sat there and watched the ship go down. And that used to be the, the, the great model of one of the great evangelists here in America. Our culture, our society is going down. Drugs, sex, human trafficking, corruption, it's going down. And what we need to do is reach out there and grab a few people out of the water and get them in our little Wesleyan lifeboats and sit out here and bob and wait for Jesus to come and take us to the heavenly shore. And there goes the ship. Watch her go, watch her go, watch her go. <laughs> Titanic mindset. Wesleyans are optimistic. God never gave up on the ship. Amen. Yes, the ship was created wonderfully. This ship that God created called human, the human race, this world, it's created wonderfully. And yes, it ran aground pretty quick. And it's messed up, and it's pretty badly damaged. God wants us to not only save the passengers, He wants us to fix the ship, people. He wants us to fix the ship. <laughs> It'll always be damaged. Wesley knew that. The ship will never be as good as it was until Jesus comes and fixes it himself. But the ship doesn't have to sink, and we don't have to be a bunch of pessimistic Wesleyans talking about how terrible things are. You didn't mention it, Dr. Pence, but there are pastors who had moral failures during the last four years. I didn't hear that in your report. There are churches that were split, and you didn't put it in your report. And there are churches we closed, and you didn't put it in your report. And thank God for not doing that. I don't want to hear about those things. I want to hear about what God is doing to transform lives, to transform communities, to transform our society. We are optimistic about what God can do. Wesley said the kingdom of God is a society which subsists. It exists first here on earth, and afterwards it'll be in glory. We don't have to wait for the kingdom of God. We can start building it now. Let's do it. Let's do it. Wesleyans make salvation top priority. And they preach a big picture, salvation. And they're willing to be unconventional in getting the task done. And they are incredibly optimistic about what they can do with God's help to actually make that kingdom come. Will you pray with me the disciples' prayer that Jesus asked us to pray? And think particularly of those first opening lines. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.